Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. Why don't you stand with us and give the Lord a good hand clap of praise in this place tonight.
Especially my mother-in-law, my or my not my mother-in-law. I'm sorry, my stepmom. In your prayers, her name's Crystal, and I know she uh, already lost her dad, and she took that really, really hard. And so I know that she's going to need to be lifted up in prayer if she loses her mom. She's very close with her; they live together in the same house. So it's I know it's going to be extremely difficult on her but she's been dealing with some uh, health issues for quite some time so just keep crystal and uh, my the rest of my family in your prayers for that need tonight if anybody else has anything you want to go ahead and let us know that if not we're going to go ahead and take these needs on the screen um, before the lord tonight and these needs that were mentioned uh, i know i see the new to me it looks like uh, Kareem, I think that's how you would say that, has a lung disease and uh, extreme weight loss and needs the Lord's touch tonight. Remember Owen's mom, she's still recovering from surgery and my Aunt Arlene, I haven't had another update on her in a few days, but just continue to remember her and these other needs on the screen that are all needs that we've been praying for. Don't forget to pray for our community for the Holy Ghost to be poured out to continue to remember those people who know God but need to come back to God those people who have left our own church who are prodigals that need to come back to the Lord just remember to lift them up tonight in your prayers if nobody else has anything you want to mention we're going to go ahead and take these needs before him right now okay, Lord we worship you tonight we thank you, God, because we can come before you, Lord, and we can bring our needs to you, God, and we can lay them down at your feet. God, all those heavy weights that we carry around sometimes, Lord, we know that we can just bring them and lay them down, God, and you will take them from us. You will give us your yoke that is much lighter than the one that we would carry on our own, God. In the name of Jesus right now, God, I pray for those people who need healing tonight, God, in their bodies. I pray that you would just touch them, Lord. In Jesus' name, God, you've been with them this whole time, God. Just let them be able to recognize, God, that you're right there where they're at, Lord. In the name of Jesus, I pray right now, God, that you would give peace and strength, God, for people who might be preparing for loss tonight, God. In the name of Jesus, I pray that you would give comfort, God, to those who are recovering, Lord, from something God, maybe it's painful in their body or maybe it's a struggle for them spiritually or maybe it's a, just something that they're struggling with in their mind, God. I pray that you would just help them tonight, give them strength and peace tonight in the name of Jesus. God, I pray that you would just touch every prodigal right now in the name of Jesus, God. Let them not 
go through this entire day, God, without being able to hear your call, without being able to hear you, God, just reaching out to them. In the name of Jesus, right now I pray, Lord, for your spirit to flow out of these four walls, out of this church body, God. In Jesus' name, right now, to every person that's outside of these four walls that would be calling out for you, God, they'd be searching for something more than they have right now, Lord. In the name of Jesus. God, I pray that you would keep us bound together as a body, Lord, as your body, God, that we would be able to be effective for your kingdom, God, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. We've brought all these needs before you tonight, God. We've prayed for all of them in your name, Jesus, because we believe that you are going to move and you're going to work and have your way, God, and let your will be done in every single one of them. Hallelujah. We worship you. We thank you, God for being such a good God to us. Hallelujah. 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 We praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Well, I believe that the Lord is moving and He's working. I know Sister Star, she testified on Sunday. And, and every now and then, God just... He just doesn't leave us hanging. He just gives us a little bit of hope, more hope to hang on to. And and sometimes it seems like nothing's going on, but something's going on. Yes. Hallelujah. He's always working. Yeah. And tonight I believe he's going to continue that work in our classes. He's going to bless you with his word. And he's going to help somebody learn something about him that they didn't already know. And somebody's life is going to be uh, changed. And, and they're going to grow tonight in the Lord. So right now we're going to go ahead and dismiss into those classes. If you intend to go to Celebrate Recovery, that class will be downstairs as usual. souls that we all must have, but uh, with the know-how, the knowledge of how to bring someone to the Lord. And I believe this uh, lesson's not going to be enlightening for us in that regard. Amen. God bless you each and every one for being in the house of the Lord as we're transitioning now over the next week to uh, get back into a new school year. Uh, 
Uh, I'm excited about what the Lord is doing and excited about how great of a summer that we've had uh, here in the church. And I believe we're going to see uh, tremendous exponential growth uh, as we get back into the school year. Um, I want you to be praying specifically for uh, Sister Stephanie and uh, Brother Reagan and Sister Erica Baker. Sister Erica is one of the teachers at our school system here. She attends uh, the Apostolic Promise Church in Cape Girada, pastored by Brother Lee, and last year was her first year teaching here. So we have some tremendous influence building um, within the school system. Of course, we have others that um, are employees there as well. But specifically, these three uh, are these two um, faculty members, Reagan and Sister Erica, along with Sister Stephanie from our youth group. Sister Stephanie has been researching starting a P7 club, which is a, a student-led Bible club. And they have got a meeting uh, set up with the uh, school principal to be able to um, see about that possibility. So we want to pray for God's favor in that um, so that they can begin to minister um, to the student body through that. And I think it's going to be a wonderful thing. And all of this comes uh, from that burden for souls that we must have. And I want to talk to you about this in depth tonight from Luke chapter 15. We're going to actually read the entire chapter and it says then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him and the Pharisees and scribes murmured saying this man receiveth sinners and eateth with them and he spake this parable unto them saying what man of you having an hundred sheep if he lose one of them doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it and when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep, which was lost. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth, more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance." Either what woman, having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, doth not light a candle, and sweep the house, and seek diligently till she find it? And when she hath found it, she calleth her friends and her neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I had lost. Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. And he said, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country. And there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in the land. And he began to be in want. Mm -hmm. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my fathers have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son, make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father, but when he was yet a long way off, a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven in thy sight, and no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, yes. and they began to be merry. Now his elder son was in the field, and as he came and drew nigh to the house, 
he heard music and dancing, and he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said unto him, Thy brother has come, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf, because he has received him safe and sound. And he was angry and would not go in. Therefore came his father out and entreated him. And he answering said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee, neither transgress I at any time thy commandment. And yet thou never gavest me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. Now I noticed that uh, at the beginning of this story of the prodigal son, that he said when the younger son asked for his portion, the Bible says he divided unto them his goods. And so he treated the elder son fairly. So the elder son had his portion of the inheritance while his dad was still alive. And he said, and everything that I have still belongs to you. So you've got it all. You've got your portion. Plus, um, you didn't have to even spend what I had given to you because I've still been taking care of your needs. And he says, it was meet that we should make merry and be glad, for this thy brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. This 15th chapter of Luke is typically viewed as three different parables. We call them the parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, and the parable of the lost or prodigal son. But all three examples are actually part and parcel of one multifaceted parable. That's why I read the whole thing together tonight. Um, It really isn't meant to be three separate parables. The Bible says that Jesus spake a parable unto them, and then the rest of the chapter is him relaying that to them. So I prefer to view this as one great parable that I call the parable of the lost. Now, how would how would you define that word parable? Um, I, I think you know, but I just want to make sure that we all understand what is meant by um, the by a parable. Jesus taught in parables uh, over and over and over again. So somebody tell me what is a parable? Huh? I'm oh, sorry, I couldn't hear you. It's an example. Okay. Um, anybody want to give a, a, a further explanation of that? An example of what? A story with an outright meaning. A story with an outright meaning? Okay. All right. So uh, I think the best synopsis of the word parable, uh, I've heard it said many times, it is an earthly story <coughs> with a heavenly meaning or a natural story that shows us a spiritual meaning. As Dad said, it is an example uh, of something that we need to learn yes, from. Sir. And so the Bible says that Jesus never spoke to the multitudes without a parable. He always took something right. from their day-to-day life that they were familiar with that they could relate to, and then he would uh, give them some spiritual food or nourishment or something to chew on, think about uh, through that story. Right. And there is much that we can learn about the lost from Uh, Luke 15, if we view the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son as different parables. Uh, Jesus used in his teaching on uh, the singular subject of saving the lost, uh, we can view that as one uh, or as separate parables, or we can view it as I am teaching tonight as really one parable. And I think there's much to gain if we take it all and analyze it as one parable particular subject with many different angles of that subject being presented instead of us viewing it as a standalone separate um, parabolic lessons. So when we look at these stories separately um, instead of as parts of one grand lesson which I think is how we normally would would teach on these the emphasis is really on the value and importance of just one lost soul. And I think that comes through very loud and clear because uh, after the first two examples, Jesus said, likewise, uh, there is joy in heaven over just one 
sinner that uh, repents. So Jesus is emphasizing here the the value of of just one. And by the way, that is a good and valid point in and of itself. The shepherd had 99 sheep in the fold, but he was not satisfied to say, well, I had 100, I still have 99, which is virtually 100, so I'm not going to put forth all the effort for that one. I mean, after all, uh, these sheep that are in the fold, they're going to multiply, they're going to have a little baby sheep, and I'll soon be back up over the 100 mark uh, again, so no need to worry about the one lost sheep. But you see, he cared about that sheep, about that one enough to make it his top priority. Uh, the woman who lost one silver coin, she still had nine coins left, didn't she? She still had all of that, but yet she swept the entire house because of the value that just that one coin held. I, I don't know if uh, how much that one silver coin uh, was worth. Uh, maybe that was worth a whole, whole lot of money. Um, but I know that uh, it'd take a lot for any of us to sweep the whole house, right? Trying to find that one coin. If we had that attitude, then there wouldn't be anything in the couch cushions, would there? Right? right? But it, it falls down. And, I mean, you wouldn't believe the stuff that's under my chair. I have a, I have a, some of you have been to our house and seen, I have a, a, a movie recliner. You know, it's one of those fancy recliners that's electric and and um, when I've got that thing reared back sometimes I'll drop my phone and it'll slide down in there yeah. you know uh, and there's certain things that if it's a piece of popcorn then it's just going to stay there right <laughs> I'm not going to get down on my hands and knees until my wife makes me but this woman she was willing to sweep the whole house he right. said for one coin so he's illustrating the value of just one and and we as a church never need to forget the value of one soul. Jesus said, I came to seek and to save that which was lost. And I just have a feeling like, and this is not really the lesson because we're, we're going to go deeper into this tonight, but I have a feeling like what we feel like is our best service sometimes and what God feels like is our best service are two different things. Right. You know, we have a lot of services, and, and in some of those services nobody repents and nobody is baptized, and nobody receives the Holy Ghost, and no one is restored, but we feel a good spirit, and the music's good, and the preaching gives a good thought for us to uh, survive on and, and think about over the next few days before we come back to the house of the Lord, and we may leave and say, man, we had a great service today, right? But God's viewpoint, maybe we have a service where the praise team's a little bit, just a, a little bit off key, and and uh, the, the drummer's struggling and the service leader just don't have it together and the preacher stutters over his, over his words. But if somebody comes to the altar and gives their heart to God, all right. the Bible says that all of heaven begins to rejoice over just one. Over just yes, one. And, and I want heaven to rejoice yes, over right. this church. Amen? Amen? And so he said heaven rejoices more over the one than over the 99 right. just persons that didn't need right. Any repentance. Now, it bears um, uh, thinking about that when Jesus told this story, it was because that people were criticizing him for uh, his attitude toward evangelism and reaching out for those who are lost. They were criticizing him and said, This guy, he will actually go and eat with sinners. He will spend time with those who don't believe like we believe and, and aren't living a good life, but yet Jesus can be seen with them and he's in their house and he's acting like he's just part of of the world so to speak and so they were very critical and that's why Jesus began to tell these stories is to illustrate to them the importance of of uh, winning the lost the father whose son asked for his inheritance to be dispensed to him prematurely left uh, left home with it he squandered it on riotous living and the father uh, could have disowned that son, and he could have said, I still have one son to pass on the family farm to. You know, I noticed that the one thing that he didn't give the prodigal was he didn't give him any of the property, right? He just gave him the cash value of whatever belonged to him, but he didn't entrust him with the property. So really the family still had everything, and the son had uh, a one-time cash um, um, 
how would you say that? Buyout. Yeah, payout. He had a one-time windfall payout. But, you know, cash tends to decrease in value, as you may have noticed recently. Uh, but now that your dollar only uh, is worth about 67 cents uh, due to inflation. Um, but property tends to go up in value over time. Right. And so the father could have said, no harm, no foul. Let's just disown him. He's, he obviously has betrayed the family, doesn't care about the family farm and, and about how important this was to grandpa and to the generations before us. And he's not worthy of it. So just let him go on. And in a couple of years, uh, we'll plant some extra wheat and we'll recoup everything that he took. That's what his attitude could have been. The family fortune was still intact despite the unwise actions of the younger son. And, um, you know, I just have to say the truth is it doesn't really hurt the church um, in the long run because one person leaves. As one pastor used to say, he always used to say, one monkey don't stop no show. You know, but uh, we're not monkeys, and uh, this isn't a show. But but it was an entertaining thought anyway. But he was just saying that the church is going to go on. And you know what? If I backslide, I believe somebody will rise up and replace me. If we fall out of the race, someone's going to rise. But our soul is worth more than anything in this world. And right. if we do fall away, God's going to love us right up through the gates of hell and reach for us right. um, because he loves um the lost soul and he wants to uh, bring us back to him so it's not just about how is the church doing uh, but it's about how is that soul faring and so the father uh, in spite of all that his son had done wrong uh, he loved him and wow. it was his priority to see that son uh, brought back home now even though as we're going to talk about um, the method of getting the son back home was not the same as it would have been in reaching some of these other, uh, these other types of, of people, of lost people. Uh, so I really want to hone in on that. That's just kind of a synopsis of the overall thing. If you took each of those parables standalone, that'd be the main message that you would get out of it um, is the value of a soul. But if we read it all together and compare and contrast the elements in these individual stories. Um, we will see some nuggets of truth that we would otherwise miss without bringing these three different sets of circumstances together. Now, Brother Reagan, a few weeks back, uh, taught on the parable um, of the ground. And I told Brother Pulliam after the service, I said, I have studied that and taught that and preached from that for 30 years and still yet Reagan brought something out of that that I had never thought about that way and had not seen uh, but if you notice the parable is not the parable of the wayside and another parable for the parable of the stony ground and another parable that we call the parable of the thorny ground or the parable of the good ground the overall message that we would get if we viewed it that way and maybe some people do the overall message we would get if we viewed each of those elements as a separate uh, standalone example would be that only 25% of ground is good ground and the rest of it ain't worth messing with. That's what we would get out of that. 75% um, is not fit and will not produce any long-term results. But when you dig deeper into the details, you begin to see how it is possible to work the poor ground so that over time it too can become good ground yes, and so that's the that's the spirit with which i'm approaching this and calling this the parable of the lost instead of teaching it as three separate parables tonight we're going to see what we can learn from this now what stands out to me first of all when i when i view these as parts of of one complete uh story is First of all, that lost people fall into three separate categories. The first category of the lost is the lost sheep. Now, here's the thing about the lost sheep. The lost sheep knows that it's lost, but doesn't know what to do about it. 
the lost sheep doesn't know where home is. He does not know how this is something different from, you're going to notice differences between these three groups. And this is what is, um, what is significant about this type of lost person. Uh, the lost sheep knows it's lost, but doesn't know how to find its way home. The lost coin, on the other hand, doesn't know it's lost. It has no self-awareness of its condition. It is not bothered by the fact that it is in a different location than the other coins. And this is the attitude of our secular world and also many people even who profess to be Christian on some level. Just you do your thing, we'll do our thing, and everything's cool. Everything's hunky-dory. Uh, we're all just kind of out here uh, doing whatever. We don't have to believe the same thing or be together in one bag. It's just, uh, it's just whatever goes. That's the attitude of the lost coin if we would personify it and give it a um, cognizant identity. But the one thing that is, is for sure is the lost coin has no awareness of its lost condition. And then there is the lost son. The lost son or the prodigal knows he's lost, but at least initially he does not want to be found. Right. He knows where home is and he knows how to get back. But he must first come to his senses and have a change of perspective and desire yes, before sir. he can be saved and we must understand that in order to save the lost if you look at these three groups we will see very quickly that we cannot have a one-size-fits-all approach to the lost the mindset and level of understanding of each of these groups is vastly different and therefore how we will successfully reach them will also be uh, very different and sometimes the reason why we're not very successful is we are using the wrong methods with the wrong type of lost people. I don't want you to think about that. I want you to think about this fact. You cannot evangelize a prodigal. You cannot evangelize a prodigal. <coughs> to evangelize is to spread the gospel through preaching and personal witness. That's the meaning of evangelism. Okay, you cannot evangelize a prodigal. Why can you not evangelize a prodigal? He already knows. He's already experienced what you've experienced. Right. Your personal testimony, he shares that testimony at some time in his life. And in fact, a prodigal, when they're wanting to, to continue in the condition they're in before uh, the party's over, um, they're going to resist any advance from you and your testimony right. and uh, talk about the goodness of God because they don't want to feel that condemnation and they don't want to change, all right? Now, you may be tempted to say, well, so-and-so, though, they was hurt. and Well, I don't think you're talking about a prodigal, okay? A prodigal is somebody who, who makes a decision and says, this is what I want to do. I know what the Word of God says. I know what the Bible teaches, but I don't want to do that. I want to do what I want to do. And they say, I'm going to take what I have, and I'm going to go out here and make my own way. That's the attitude of the prodigal until they get out there and realize uh, just how rough it is outside of the father's house. So you can't evangelize a prodigal to win them back. Evangelism is for lost sheep and lost coins. The approach that is required for the prodigal, and we'll talk about this more a little bit later on, is prayer, fasting, and loving them in spite of their choices without chasing them and coddling them and begging them to live for God. Now, right. if you disagree with me, then we're going to just have to uh, agree to disagree. But I just don't think that you can chase a prodigal down and, and make them come back home. And the Bible doesn't tell us that the father did that. No, sir. He did not go out and look for the son and drag him out of the bar and say, this isn't where you belong. The prodigal knew that wasn't where he belonged. Right. But sometimes if we use that approach, and can I just say, if a prodigal finds themselves in the house of God, sometimes our temptation is to go and try to pull that person to the altar. 
And when you do that, you might actually uh, drive them away uh, because they're not ready for that. So you have to you have to let prayer and fasting make the difference. Um, and you have to just love them at every opportunity. But sometimes you have to love the prodigal from a distance. And uh, coddling them and begging them will not bear fruit. Does that make sense? Yes, now, we'll come back to the prodigal son here uh, shortly. Oh, my goodness. 743. i got to hurry. All right. Let's go back to uh, the lost sheep. Uh, this group represents, I believe, the majority of the people that we are trying to reach. The majority of people that we're needing to reach, they are not prodigals. They are in the lost sheep category. Now, let me explain why I believe that. I believe that people that have never even known the Lord, many of them fall into the lost sheep category, okay? Uh, because the lost sheep... Um, knows that it's lost, and I believe that most people deep down know that they are lost. Even if they don't know how to articulate that, even if they don't uh, put it in those terms, uh, they don't know what to do about it, but they sense the absence of their shepherd. And the reason why that is, and why we can say that for people that have never even walked through the doors of a church, is because when God created humanity, he did so in a very personally involved way, unlike the way that he created the other works of creation by simply speaking them into existence. Genesis 2 and 7 tells us that the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And so there is a forever uh, connection, if you can say, that is different from any other part of creation between God and humanity. And even though the relationship has been severed, um, still yet I believe that every human being is born with an innate uh, awareness or I don't know how you put it, we call it a God-sized hole in our heart. They know that something is missing until they find the Lord. They may try to fill that with all kinds of things out in the world. But the reason why they do that is because they feel lost. Uh, they feel dead inside. They feel like something is missing. And uh, I believe that every human that's been born since that time of creation has been carefully formed by God. And Psalm 139 and 13 uh, says that, uh, that God has covered me in my mother's womb. And so I, this is what I believe. I believe that because of the way that God created humanity, and I believe that as a child is forming in the womb, I believe that the presence of God is there. The Bible teaches that, that, um, that yes, when we're being formed and whenever our members cannot even be determined, that the presence of God is there. Right. Okay, And so uh, a human being comes into existence uh, cradled by the presence of God. Amen. Now, if I could use an example, uh, these twins of Mariah and Owens, I mean, they're such a joy. And um, uh, they're at our house every day during the week for about eight hours. And um, Jamie has learned very quickly the little tricks and things that she has to do to get them to take their naps. They're getting where they begin to fight sleep. Now, there's one particular song by Indiana Bible College that... Sawyer will go to sleep to instantly if he's tired. Now, you can put on another song, and he'll look around, and he'll fight sleep for a while. But if you put on that particular song, it's just like magic. I mean, he is gone just within seconds. And if anybody knows Mariah, she loves Indiana Bible College music. They play it all the time in their house. And I could probably assure you that uh, when Sawyer was in the womb and did not have any true cognizance of anything going on, that music was being piped in, right? Yes. And in some way, he was feeling the rhythm of that and the soothing right. of that and the presence of God there covering the child in the womb. And so he gets comfort from that. Now, I can't prove that, um, but I just think it's too much to be a coincidence. 
So think about that. A child, uh, and, they, and uh, doctors uh, will tell you uh, to talk to the baby when it's in the womb, you know, to uh, sing to it and all these things. That may seem ridiculous, but what's happening is you're covering that child every day of gestation uh, with uh, something that becomes familiar and comforting to them uh, later on. So uh, I believe that every person that's born um, has that instinct that longs for God. Does that make any sense? And lost sheep are tormented by the lack of the good shepherd's presence and they will recognize the presence of the Lord as home once someone goes to them in the spirit of the shepherd and carries them to the fold. And I want to emphasize this. Lost sheep will not be saved without evangelistic effort. They will not just stumble back to the fold. They don't know where home is. Some of them may have never had an experience with God, but I'm telling you that that, that is buried within them. And we're going to talk about the lost coin and how that uh, a group can, uh, a person can be moved out of this category of lost sheep and become the lost coin type of person that needs to be saved. But by and large, I think that most people need someone to go to them and they need to be able to recognize the shepherd. Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. Right. Okay? And they will not respond to another. So if you go to someone that's lost and you approach them, but not, in, not with the spirit of God, not with, um, not with the presence of God that makes the difference, you're not going to be able to win them. But your personal witness, your testimony can absolutely carry someone to where they need to be when they recognize the presence of the shepherd that um, they long for, okay? But they will not be saved without our efforts, and that's the vast majority of people. Now let's talk about the second group. i got 10 minutes here. The lost coins. This group, I believe, is similar or is smaller than the first, but it is constantly becoming a larger percentage of the population through the uh, misinforming and disinforming of the human conscious. They don't know they're lost. They have no self-awareness of their unsaved condition. And they must also be evangelized, but it's a different method of evangelism. Again, I believe every human is born with an innate sense of the existence of God. But what happens is through humanistic teaching, Eventually, many people are convinced that God is not real, or if he is, uh, he is far away and completely detached from the affairs of mankind. And once they believe that, they lose that sense of the fact that I'm lost and I'm missing something, and they just accept that, you know what, this is just the way that it is. We're all just out here on our own. We're all doing our own thing. When we die, that's just the end. There's nobody looking for us. There's nobody looking out for us. Eat, drink, be merry, have a great time, live out your days uh, to the fullest because once it's over, it's over. Have you met people like that? They just don't believe in any of this, uh, any of this uh, stuff called the Bible um, and the things that we're teaching about. So subsequently, your approach to that person has to be different. Their conscience has been misinformed or disinformed. And they have no self-awareness. So it does no good for you to tell them that such and such is a sin because the Bible says this. They don't believe the Bible is God's word. They don't believe that God exists. So your approach to that person is going to have to be different. How, how, would, your, what, how would you approach someone that does not believe in God? It's not the same approach as with the lost sheep. The lost sheep understands the comfort of the shepherd. You have, to show, you have to show them God. You have to show them God. You have to be that open epistle yeah. that's read of all men. Your personal life has to become a light to them. Mm -hmm. And uh, and you may even have to uh, go back and use some uh, good science to prove to them the existence of God. You can use the Bible if you can relate it to them in terms of science. 
and see what the Word of God has proven uh, scientifically that once men thought this and now, they, now they've come to this understanding. One example is the, um, the earth being uh, a spear. Um, men used to believe that the earth was flat. But long before they realized that it was, uh, was a spear, um, the Bible says that the Lord sits on the circle of the earth. And right. so Job proclaimed that without any knowledge other than the knowledge of God. He had no telescope or anything or a spaceship where he could get out far enough away from, um, from the earth to see the curvature of it and to see it's, the way it looks. Uh, but God revealed that. So there's many things like that that we can see that science once held a position and they would use that position to disprove the Bible, but as they've gained more knowledge, um, they begin to disprove their own theories. Okay, so that's an example of, of trying to reach uh, the lost coin. Now, I would say that also included in this group because what's the parameters of the lost coin's um, condition it is that they have no awareness of their lost condition. So I would even include in this group, which uh, totally flipping it from head to tails, right? Uh, this is a totally different view of it. Uh, but people who have been taught a false plan of salvation, such as being a good person, you're going to go to heaven, or just a simple acknowledgement of Christ as Savior, uh, minus an actual relationship with God, they've been taught that that is what constitutes salvation, just acknowledge God. Um, and you're saved and so because these people have been told that they are saved they have no awareness that they are lost okay and i believe this is harder to overcome i believe it's harder to reach the lost coin than it is to reach the lost sheep why because the lost sheep is hurting the lost sheep is is um is scared the lost sheep is hoping that somebody finds me they just don't know they don't know how to get home and, uh, and, and they're looking for a solution. They just don't understand how to get where they need to be. But the lost coin, on the other hand, does not recognize its condition. And so it was up to the woman of the house in this story to sweep the house. And if we're going to reach the lost coins of our world, and they are many, and there's more and more lost coins hitting the floor every day, if we're going to find them, we've got to exhaust every measure Available. We have to sweep every inch of the house. When someone goes and looks for uh, someone that's missing, someone that's been abducted, and they get a lead, or, or maybe a child wandered off from the house, and they don't know if they're in the woods or out in the field, you'll see them line up, and they'll walk every inch of that field, and they're looking for that child. They're looking for that missing purpose, uh, person. Uh, they go into the woods. They take the dogs and, and take a piece of clothing and and they search diligently to find that lost person. And that's what we've got to be as a church. We've got to be willing to do an exhaustive search right. for those souls that aren't even aware, perhaps, of their uh, condition before we can lead them to salvation. I've, I'm going to have to go over just a little bit here to get done, but I think we can do it. I always think I have more time than I do. Do you ever do that, Brother Pulliam? Yeah. All right, 1 Corinthians 9, verse 19 through 22, and the epistle of Jude, uh, both offer strong advice to us in regard to the importance of varied evangelistic methods. Now, Paul said, For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law, as without law being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without the law. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men, that by all means I might, uh, I might by all means save some. Yes, sir. So even after we've exhausted every effort, uh, I hate to tell you we're going to still have lost people out there that we haven't reached, but right. the Apostle Paul said you're not going to reach hardly anybody unless you're willing to depart from your favorite method when it doesn't work okay and so i'm just trying to educate us to understand um let's identify what kind of lost person we're dealing with and if it's a person uh that is not open to truth 
then there's no need to teach them a search for truth Bible study for 15 weeks. Okay, you got to first convince them to listen to you. And it may be simply, uh, Brother Pulliam, your testimony that you were an alcoholic and God delivered you. You know what I'm saying? Nobody can really uh, argue with your personal testimony. So sometimes that's the method, that's the inroad. Look at, find out where they're living, what they're struggling with, and then you can begin to uh, identify with them uh, by sharing your personal testimony of what God has done for you or how you determined that God was real in your own life. Uh, Jude chapter 1, verse 21 through 23 says, Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. So important that we keep ourselves in the love of God, that we minister through the love of God, that we look for mercy in every, at every opportunity. Okay? Uh, look for the opportunity to make a difference. And he said here, And of some have compassion, making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Right. So there's some people that they, they might need to be told, uh, you're, you're on your way to hell. I mean, maybe that's what will get their attention, but you better be sensitive to the Spirit to know if that's the approach you need to use with that person. Because if you use that approach uh, when it's not in order uh, and that person really just needs some love and compassion shown to them, you're going to uh, eliminate your influence and ability to help them. Well, you say, well, but it's the truth and it don't matter what they think. Well, it does matter what they think. Because unless they can receive truth, they're going to be lost. Okay, So we can't afford to present God to somebody in a way that they cannot uh, comprehend or receive him. So there, Jesus reveals to us here in this parable, there are methods at work with different types of people and diff- at different stations of life. And we need to make sure that we employ all of those things. Okay, now let's finish up. Um, here by talking about the prodigal. I think I can do this in five minutes. Um, Remember, the prodigal knows he's lost, but at least initially he does not want to be found. He knows exactly where home is. He knows how to get back home. Um, But the reality of the prodigal is something that we need to look at. Okay, I've been showing you this slide. We're going to change this over here. I've been showing you this slide on the left all the way through. That's how we see the prodigal. Helpless right the lost son he's a little child that's the way that father viewed his son now his son was grown but the father looks at his son that's my boy right and we should look at a person that way all right Uh, that's away from God but at the same time we need to understand the reality of the prodigal is what we see on the right he's a grown man he's living out his decisions okay and he has got to come to himself in order to be saved. We cannot save him against his will. We cannot make him come home. Right. All right? And there are obstacles to the prodigal's return. And that's why I say that uh, evangelism does not work on prodigals. The prodigal understands and has already experienced the power of the gospel, but he has things in his way that are preventing his safe return Uh, to God and these things chiefly are a wayward heart and mind okay and condemnation so once he gets past his waywardness then the devil is going to use the mistakes to keep him in his condition shame okay condemnation Um, and this is where we can never afford to have that elder brother mentality that doesn't welcome the prodigal back home when they make the decision to come back to their father's house okay because guess what the devil's already told them that Mm -hmm. the devil's already told them how many months he's laying in the pig pen what's the devil telling him you messed up too bad they'll never accept you Uh, your brothers and sisters they don't want you back home Uh, you've you've harmed uh, the church Uh, you sinned against God you went too far Uh, you know, probably uh, told the prodigal that you've committed the unpardonable sin and so on and so forth. So those things have got to be overcome in order to uh, win the prodigal back. So 
just as we're finishing up here, how do we reach the prodigal who does not want to be reached? And we talked about it briefly in the beginning, but how do you reach the person who doesn't want to be reached? Prayer and fasting. They need deliverance. The Bible also says in the Old Testament, God said, I will heal their backslidings. We need to understand that backsliders need healing. Yes, sir. Okay? And that's the way that God frames it. They're sick. They're sick. They need healing, of maybe not physically, but of their mind, of their emotions. Um, and the world will chew you up and spit you out. As someone said, chew you up and spit out the pieces that they don't like. Uh, and so in the end, that person is just a shell of their former self. Um, but we can reach them uh, by loving them. I will say, don't coddle, don't beg, but pray fast and remember that prayer can go anywhere that God can go. That's right. And fasting, what will fasting do? Fasting will increase our sensitivity to what yes, God is doing and will help us to know when and what to speak into their lives. Because you have to be very careful with the prodigal to reach them. Right. Well, like I said, they've got their guard up. Um, and perhaps initially they do not want to go home. But I do believe if we will pray and fast that God will work on the other end of the line and that prodigal uh, will come to their senses. The Bible says that if you train up a child in the way he should go, when he is old, he will not depart from it. So you can say, well, I know a lot of people that departed from the faith. They can't get away from what they were taught. If you taught it, and uh, you put the effort in, then and their experience with God, they can't. They may claim that they don't believe it, but deep down, that is there. And when they come to themselves, they will realize uh, that they need to get back uh, with God. But let's not be a barrier to them. Let's not be that one that would hinder them. But make sure they're accepted with love, uh, and also realize that this is another thing that is very, very. Uh, bad on our part as the church, okay, if we're not careful. When a prodigal comes back, they are not the same as when they left, right. okay? And what is the attitude many times of, the, of people that know the Lord in the church? When the prodigal comes back, we expect them to do everything to overnight to be because they already know, right? They already know all the things they should be doing and what they should be letting go of and what they should be changing in their lives. And the reality is that while they've been out in the world, their mind has been warped, right. okay? Uh, and they don't, they don't necessarily believe everything the way they believed it at one time, okay? Right. So what has to happen is there has to be that continual washing of water by the word, right. and over time that will change. And I That's believe good. that my sister sitting back there would tell you that. How long were you not in church after... Okay, about 24 years, okay? And I remember having conversations with my sister on the phone, if I can just say this, and I won't go into any details. But I remember having conversations with her on the phone during the time that she was uh, away from God and away from the church. Mm -hmm. And when I would hang up, I would think, I can't believe that she believes like that political right. view or that view on, on a particular uh, topic that, you know, you would just think, surely she would never think that. But the world has changed the way we think when we're in the world, okay? Right. Whatever you're around, That's evil right. communication corrupts good manners, and we are changed by that. And so when that person comes back into the church, they're going to also, when they first come back, they're going to still be holding on. They're still going to have the stink of the pig pen on them, right. and it takes time for them to get back to the condition. If they've not been eaten spiritually, they're going to be emaciated and weak, Right. And so it's up to us uh, to kill the fatted calf and say, hey, it's time for you to eat. It's time for you to enjoy the right. presence of the Lord. It's time for you to uh, re remember what home was supposed to be like. And that's what, father, what the father was doing. Right. He was saying, I don't care what happened back there. You're part of the family. Here's the ring. Here's the fatted calf. Here's the celebration. And the elder brother said, they don't deserve that. Look what they've done with their lives. Right. Okay. So we got to make sure we don't have that attitude 
that we help them uh, to get back to God. Amen. God bless you. Let's stand together. I hope that you receive something from this. Let's get out there and let's evangelize the lost and let's love the prodigals. And let's look for opportunities through prayer and fasting to speak into their lives as well as sweeping the house. That's, I believe, applies to what Jesus said, go out into the highways and the byways and compel them to come in. Uh, we got to find those lost coins. We have to find those lost sheep that are hurting. And if that will be the heartbeat of us, then this church will be completely packed out uh, as we uh, do what God has called us to do. Amen. Lord, we thank you for this night, for this opportunity uh, to be in your house together with your people. And I pray your blessing upon each one, Lord, that you would bless our efforts to evangelize, to win our neighbors, our friends, our loved ones, and even our enemies, Lord, to truth. We pray you would help us by our example and, and by greater knowledge of your word each and every day that we would be able to minister in every kind of situation. We give you praise for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed in the name of the Lord. Thank you.